Chapter 1 The Love Making of the Wild It was cold and the pack was hungry. In truth, they looked more like skeletons than wolves. At the front of the pack ran a large grey wolf. He was one of the leaders of the pack. He snarled at all the other wolves if they tried to go faster than him. But he did not snarl at the red-haired she-wolf who ran next to him. He didn't even show her his teeth if she happened to run in front of him. In fact, he seemed to like it. He seemed to like her. In her opinion, he liked her too much. He tried to run too close to her. He even tried to touch her neck or shoulders with his nose. But then she snarled at him irritably and showed him her teeth. He never snarled back. The large grey wolf was not her only admirer, though. On her right ran an old one-eyed wolf. He was one of the older leaders of the pack. His body and fur showed many signs of past battles. From time to time he also tried to touch her neck with his nose. Then she snarled at him warningly. He never snarled back at her either. But if the two leaders were all kindness towards the red she-wolf, they were all hatred towards each other. But they weren't fighting openly yet. They were both waiting for the best moment. They knew it would be a battle of life and death. The best moment came first for old One-Eye. He noticed how the young wolf turned his head to lick his shoulder, showing his neck to his rival. The old wolf attacked him suddenly and without warning, closing his fangs on the young leader's neck. His teeth opened the great vein of his neck, and blood began quickly to flow out. The younger wolf snarled painfully and tried to fight back, but his legs would no longer hold him, and he fell to the snow. The battle was over. Through all of this, the she-wolf sat and watched, and smiled. She was glad with the battle, because this was love-making of the wild. This time, experience triumphed over youth. When one eye came up to the she-wolf again, she didn't snarl at him any more. Instead, she touched noses with him. The dead rival was already forgotten. Soon they were best friends, running happily side by side through the snowy woods. After some days, the she-wolf began to feel uncomfortable. She seemed to be looking for something. She looked under all fallen trees and into empty caves. Old One-Eye was not interested at all, but he followed her anyway. And so they travelled across the country until they got to the banks of the Mackenzie River. There they hung about the Indian camp for some time. One Eye didn't like it, but the she-wolf seemed more than comfortable with the human voices nearby. She was very heavy now, and could only run very slowly. She was also less patient than ever. She was not quick enough to catch meat herself, and she was angry with One Eye if he failed to hunt successfully for both of them. Fortunately for the old wolf, she finally found what she had been looking for. It was a cave. Old One-Eye watched her patiently as she inspected it carefully for hours. In the end, she lay down, put her head on her paws and yawned to show that she was pleased and satisfied. But One-Eye did not understand. He was hungry. He tried to persuade her to get up and go searching for food, but she only snarled at him impatiently. So he went hunting on his own, confused. He had been gone for eight hours and hadn't caught anything when he finally came back to the cave. And there he was in for a surprise. Strange sounds were coming from the cave, and they were not made by the she-wolf. But he could hear her too, snarling at him warningly, she was warning him against eating the small things making tiny noises. She needn't have done so, though. He understood. He had been a father before. The instinct of fatherhood awoke in him again. 
He turned back. He must find meat. When he came back again with the day's hunt, two rabbits and a squirrel, the she-wolf licked him on the neck approvingly. He was behaving like a wolf father should, and he was showing no desire to eat up the young lives she had brought into the world. Chapter 2 The Law of Meat He was different from his brothers and sisters. Their hair was already turning red like their mother's. He alone took after his father. He was the one grey cub out of all of them. He was also the fiercest of them all. He could growl the loudest, and he was the first to learn the trick of hurting another cub with his paws or teeth. It was to be expected. He was a meat-eater already, and he was brought up to become a meat-killer. Most of his first weeks had been spent sleeping, but now, with his eyes wide open, he was starting to learn his world quite well. It was a dark world and a very small one, but he didn't know that, as he knew no other world. But he had discovered one strange thing about his world. One of its walls seemed to be made of light through which his father could come and go. The cub himself tried the trick with the other walls of his world, but it never worked. He had always felt a strong need to try it with the wall of light, and he always tried to go in the wall's direction. And that was how he learned more things about his mother than her warm, soft tongue, with which she used to stroke him affectionately. It turned out that she also had a sharp nose and strong paws, with which she could hurt when she wanted to punish. Thus, he learnt hurt and danger, and he learnt to hide from hurt and to be afraid of danger. Like most animals of the wild, he early experienced hunger. There came a time when his father brought no meat, and milk stopped flowing from his mother's breast. At first the cubs cried and growled, but then they mostly slept, turning slowly into little skeletons. One eye was desperate. He slept little and constantly hunted, but with no success. The she-wolf, too, left her cubs to look for meat. When the parents finally brought more food, there were only two cubs left in the cave, the grey cub and his sister. But the meat came too late for her, too. She never woke up again. The family was reduced to the three of them. Soon, it was reduced even further. There came a time when the grey cub no longer saw his father appearing and disappearing through the wall of light. The she-wolf knew why one eye never came back, but there was no way by which she could tell her grey cub what she had seen. She had followed a day-old smell of one eye, and she found him, or what remained of him, outside a lynx's cave. There were signs that told her that the lynx was inside and that she had a litter of hungry kittens who were now feasting on one eye's meat. She didn't dare go in as she knew the lynx as a bad-tempered creature and a terrible fighter. After that, in her hunting she always avoided the path up to the lynx's cave. By the time his mother began leaving her cave to hunt, the grey cub had learnt well that he should be afraid of the wall of light. But there were other forces at work in him apart from the fear. The greatest of them was the need to grow. It demanded overcoming this fear, and one day, after his mother had left, the grey cub began to walk slowly towards the wall of light. He expected the worst, but felt ready for it. But to his great surprise, he was going through the wall, just like he had seen his parents go through it before, and it didn't hurt at all. He grew bolder with every step. He didn't notice that the next step would be on the air, and the next moment he was falling head downwards and rolling down the slope crying at the top of his voice. When at last he came to a stop, he gave one long, loud cry of fear. But nothing happened, and his mother didn't come to his rescue. So he sat down and looked around, as might the first man to land on Mars. He smelled the grass, looked at the trees and bushes, 
and at the blue and green open space between them. He saw a squirrel, and fear paralysed him again. But the squirrel was just as scared of him as he was of it. It ran up a tree, crying in a strange voice. This gave him a little confidence. He moved on and looked around more. He was learning. There were live things, and things not alive. The things not alive could be expected to stay in one place, but the live things moved, and there was no telling what they might do. He had beginner's luck. As he wandered around this newly discovered world, he suddenly fell into a large hole full of moving live things. It was a nest of a bird who had left her chicks and had gone to look for food for them. The chicks jumped around and made a lot of noise. At first they frightened him and he cried, but then he noticed that they were very small, much smaller than him. He picked one up in his mouth. Suddenly he realised he was hungry, and as his jaws closed on the small chick and warm blood ran into his mouth, he felt happier than ever before. He ate all the chicks. When he was finally moving out of the nest, a big live thing started to cry and beat him with large feathered wings. It was the mother bird who realised he had destroyed her nest. She was in a fury, but he didn't see anything wrong with it and wanted to kill again. So he started the fight back, but the bird was much bigger and stronger than him. Apart from the large wings, she had a strong beak with which she delivered painful blows on the cub's soft nose. Finally, he gave up and left the bird to cry over her destroyed nest. He had learnt a new law. Live things were meat. They were good to eat. But if they were big enough, they could hurt. So it was better to eat small live things like chicks and to leave alone large things like mother birds. He would have looked for more little live things to fight against if his nose hadn't hurt so much and if he hadn't felt so very tired suddenly. Luckily, his mother came back and found him crying quietly beneath a bush. She recognised the signs of a battle on his nose and fur. She licked him affectionately and took him back to the cave to rest. Since that day, the cub developed even faster than he had done before. Soon he began to accompany his mother on her hunts for meat. He saw much killing and began to play his part in it, he started to understand the law of meat. The aim of life was meat. Life itself was meat. Life lived on life. There were the eaters and the eaten. The law was eat or be eaten. Chapter 3 The Makers of Fire The cub met them suddenly. He had left the cave in the morning and was running down to the nearby stream to drink. He wasn't paying a lot of attention because he knew the way to the stream very well and felt safe there. But suddenly he smelt and saw five big live things. He didn't know they were Indians from the nearby camp. He had never seen such strange live things before. They noticed him, but they didn't move or show their teeth. They just sat and looked at him, and though he didn't know why, their sight filled him with fear. Slowly, one of the Indians stood up and walked over to the cub. He started to move his hand towards the cub's head. The cub's hair stood up, and he snarled as terribly as he could, but he didn't move. <laughs> the man laughed and said, Waban wabiska ip pita. Look, white fangs. The other Indians laughed loudly. The cub didn't like the sound of their laughter at all. The next moment he saw that the Indian's hand was moving closer to his head again. Two instincts were fighting in the cub at that moment. On the one hand he wanted to bite this hand, but on the other he felt that he should let it rest on his head. 
he chose a compromise. He let the hand come as close to his head as he could bear it, and then he jumped on the hand and sank his white fangs in it. The next thing the cub knew was a sudden and strong blow on his head, and another, and another. And then he didn't want to fight any more. He left the hand and cried in great pain. The five Indians had come closer and were now standing around him and laughing even louder than before. Suddenly they all heard something, but only the cub knew what it was. His mother was coming to save him. She had heard the cries of her cub and was coming with her hair standing up and showing her teeth. She stopped in front of her son and snarled terribly at the five men, ready to fight them all. And then something completely unexpected happened. Kicha, cried one of the Indians in surprise. The she-wolf was surprised too. Kicha, he cried again, this time with authority in his voice. And then the unbelievable happened. The cub saw his great mother the killer of live things, lie down on the ground, moving her tail in peace signs. He couldn't understand it at all. The man who had spoken to the she-wolf came over to her and put his hand on her head. To the crub's great surprise, she neither snarled at him nor showed him her teeth. It is not strange, the Indian said. Her mother was a dog. But her father was a wolf. It has been a year, Grey Beaver, since she ran away, spoke the second Indian. It is not strange, Grey Beaver answered. It was a time of great hunger when she ran away. There was no meat for the dogs then. She has lived with the wolves, the third Indian said. She has, answered Grey Beaver, and that is the sign of it he said, pointing at the cub. His fangs are white, and so White Fang will be his name. I have spoken. Kitche is my dog, and so is he. And as he was speaking, he put a rope around their necks. They were going to the Indian camp, Kitche obediently following Grey Beaver, and White Fang doing the same. Once they got to the camp, Grey Beaver tied Kitche to a tree so that she couldn't escape back to the woods. But he didn't tie White Fang. He knew that the cub wouldn't go far without his mother. And so White Fang had complete freedom to look around the camp. There were lots of strange things, and the cub was a little afraid at first. But soon his curiosity became stronger than his fear, and it pushed him onto his first exploratory trip around the man-animal's grounds. He looked at the camp in wonder. It was buzzing with movement. There were lots of dogs and lots of man-animals everywhere. The man-animals impressed him greatly with their power. They had power over things not alive. He saw it. They could move them about. Even the small man-animals could pick up stones and throw them around. The big man-animals were moving sticks about so cleverly that they could make hiding places out of them. It was the first time White Fang had seen a teepee being built, and as he watched the process, he felt more and more admiration for the man-animals. They were like gods. And then a dog caught his attention. It was a puppy, like White Fang, but a few months older than him and so a bit bigger and stronger. His name was Lip Lip, and he was the puppy leader of the camp. Lip Lip saw that White Fang was a new puppy, and so he decided that a fight was necessary to show White Fang that he was the true leader of all puppies at the campsite. He snarled at White Fang and showed him his teeth. But White Fang wasn't easily frightened. He snarled back. Then suddenly, without any warning, Lip Lip jumped onto White Fang and sank his teeth into the cub's shoulder. It hurt really badly, and White Fang cried with pain. 
Chicha hurt him and barked furiously, but she was too far away to help her son. After some struggle, White Fang finally managed to shake Lip Lip off his back and ran to his mother for protection. In his heart, he promised to revenge Lip Lip. Meanwhile, Kitta lipped White Fang's wounds and calmed his anger as she softly stroked his face with her tongue. Soon the cub felt much better around his mother, and he promised himself never to leave her again. But not even five minutes passed, and he was by Grey Beaver's teepee all on his own again. Something very interesting was happening there, and he just had to have a quick look to see what was happening. Women and children were bringing lots of wooden sticks around and leaving it outside of Grey Beaver's teepee. When there were so many of them that they created a big heap, Grey Beaver moved them around and started to make some strange rubbing movements. Suddenly, something the colour of the sun started to move among the sticks. White Fang knew nothing about fire. It looked like a strange live thing to him. He moved towards it. He wanted to smell and taste this strange live thing. His nose and tongue touched the flame at the same time, and a moment later he cried in great pain and terror. Nothing had ever hurt him so much. Grey Beaver and the other Indians who had been watching White Fang burst out laughing. White Fang recognised the sound of their laughter, and he understood the meaning of it. He felt shame that the man-animals should be laughing at him so. It hurt his spirit, even more than the fire hurt his nose and tongue. He looked at the men around him, and he realised they were stronger and more powerful than any live things he had ever seen. They could hurt your spirit by mere mouth noises. They could make an orange-biting live thing out of wood. They were fire-makers. They were gods. Chapter 4 The Bondage In the wild, the time of a wolf mother with her young is generally very short, but at a man's campsite it is sometimes even shorter. In the middle of the summer, Grey Beaver found himself in debt to three eagles. He decided to pay it with Kitcha. Three eagles accepted the deal, and as he was going on a trip up the Mackenzie River, Kitcha would go there with him. White Fang suspected something bad was going to happen when he saw three eagles leading Kitcha towards the canoes. He followed them, looking around nervously. When he saw his mother being put into a departing canoe, he started at once to cry and started to swim after the canoe. Grey Beaver had been watching White Fang all the way through. Now he called him to come back in an angry voice, but White Fang was already deep in the water. Grey Beaver called him again, but White Fang was clearly not listening. Grey Beaver's face hardened in anger. He jumped into his canoe and within seconds overtook White Fang. He turned around, reached down and pulled the crying puppy out of the water. White Fang saw his mother become smaller and smaller in the distance and furiously struggled to get back into the river. But then he felt a heavy blow on his head and another one and another one. At first he was surprised, then he was afraid, but soon he became as angry as Grey Beaver. He snarled as frighteningly as he could, but that only made Grey Beaver's blows come faster and with greater strength. Soon White Fang's snarl turned into a loud cry. Grey Beaver seemed satisfied. He pushed the puppy onto the bottom of the canoe, but the moment he did that, White Fang jumped onto Grey Beaver's moccasin's foot and sank his teeth into it. The beating he had got before was nothing compared to the beating he received now. Grey Beaver's blows fell on his head and shoulders till he was barely conscious. White Fang learned another big lesson in his life. Never, 
no matter what happens, must he bite his god. When Grey Beaver finally pushed him back onto the bottom of the canoe, White Fang didn't even dare to look in the direction of his master's feet. His spirit was broken. He missed his mother for days. At night he would go onto the edge of the forest and cry out loudly. Then he would listen to the wild, calling him away into the woods. He often hesitated, but never went further in than the first two rows of trees. The memories of Kitcha held him back in the camp. He would wait for her to come back. Then they would return into the wild together. Meanwhile, he stayed in the camp. He wasn't happy there, but he was getting used to the ways of the dogs and the men, and he was learning to find his ways around them. In time, he learned to respect Grey Beaver as his god, though Grey Beaver was by no means a loving god. He was just a god. He would punish with heavy beating for any disobedience, and he would also protect White Fang from other dogs' attacks, and he would make sure that White Fang always had enough meat in the evening. In the fall of that year, when days were becoming shorter and colder, White Fang sensed something strange happening about the camp. It was getting smaller. The spaces between the teepees were getting bigger. There were fewer and fewer squalls around. The truth was, the camp was being gradually packed up and moved for the winter season. The canoes, which were filled with women, children and dogs, were disappearing down the river. But White Fang didn't want to go with them. What if Kitche came back? He had to wait for her. When he saw Grey Beaver's squall taking down the family teepee, he hid in the bushes at the edge of the woods and waited. A couple of hours later, he heard Grey Beaver's voice calling him from the canoe. He shook with fear, but he didn't move. After some time, the voices died away in the distance. White Fang didn't move from the bushes for another hour or so. When he finally came out, it was dark. It was also very cold. He went in the direction of the woods, but it was even darker and colder there. The wilds calling him didn't sound familiar anymore. It sounded more like danger. His hair stood up on end, and he turned back to where the camp used to be. But the place was empty now. There was no fire to lie by and warm up. There was no grey beaver who he could stand beside and feel safe, and there was no meat thrown to him by grey beaver's squaw. Suddenly White Fang felt more lonely than he had ever felt before. He sat down and pointed his nose at the moon, and for the first time howled like a grown wolf. All that night, he ran in the direction of where Grey Beaver's canoe had gone. By the middle of the second day, he had been running continuously for thirty hours. He hadn't eaten for forty hours and was weak with hunger. To make it worse, snow began to fall, making the way slippery and unsafe. Night had fallen again. White Fang's feet were bleeding, and he was crying softly to himself. Suddenly, he smelt a fresh trail of grey beaver. He followed it as fast as his weak legs could carry him. Soon, the camp sounds came to his ears, and he saw the light of the fire. Grey beaver was sitting by the fire eating a piece of raw meat. White Fang went forward, slowly, scared at the thought of receiving beatings. His hair stood up at the thought of it, but then he went a few steps forward again. Slowly, he came into the circle of the firelight. Grey Beaver saw him and stopped eating. White Fang moved very slowly now, low at his feet with his head just above the snow. At last, he lay at his master's feet. This moment changed everything in White Fang's life. He had come out of the wild to sit by a man's fire and to be ruled by him. It was his own choice to do so. He had surrendered himself to his master, 
body and soul. Now he was waiting for his punishment, but minutes passed and no blows fell on his head. He slowly looked up. Grey Beaver was breaking a piece of meat into two. He put one half into his mouth, while the other one he was, unbelievably, offering to White Fang. He accepted it gratefully. Soon he was asleep at his master's feet. Tomorrow wouldn't find him lonely, running through the dark forest, but in the camp of man-animals on whom he had now made himself dependent. Chapter 5 A New God White Fang was nearly five years old. By that time he had grown to be a strong and an angry dog. Both men and dogs were afraid of him. He had always been an outsider of the pack, and he had never made friends with other dogs. On the contrary, he had become a very efficient fighter and killer of other dogs. A single dog had no chance against him. He was too quick and too intelligent, and he employed this perfect mechanism of his body and brain to kill others. If he had spent more time with his mother, if he had been brought up amongst other puppies from the beginning, and if Grey Beaver had been a more loving master, White Fang could have turned out different. As it was, he had become a lonely, unloving, and ferocious enemy of other dogs. It was in the summer when White Fang turned five that Grey Beaver took him on a journey to the Yukon. They settled in Fort Yukon, where Grey Beaver wanted to sell furs and moccasins to the white men looking for gold there. And so it was in Fort Yukon that White Fang saw his first white people. As compared with the Indians he had known, they seemed to him a race of more powerful gods. But if the white gods were powerful, their dogs did not match the master's strength. White Fang's conclusion was that they were mostly soft, made much noise and extremely easy to kill, and so killing them became a sport for White Fang. But White Fang was wise. He never made a show of killing white men's dogs. He had learnt long that the gods were made angry when their dogs were killed, and white men were no exception to this. So what White Fang did was to attack a dog and before his victim could attract his master's attention with his cries, he would have his throat open with one perfectly calculated slash of fangs. Then White Fang would leave the crying unfortunate for other dogs, and they finished the cruel job. Then if the master of the murdered dog was around, he would take revenge on the other dogs, not on White Fang. Soon White Fang became a true expert at it, and while Grey Beaver was selling furs to the White Gods, White Fang made it his main occupation to kill their dogs. Most people, if they saw such a dog as White Fang was then, would avoid him as far as they could. But there was one white man in Fort Yukon who had been observing him for some time. And the more cleverly cruel White Fang appeared, the more the man admired him. His name was Beauty Smith. His name Beauty sounded ironic when you looked at him, as he was widely recognised as the ugliest man in Fort Yukon. Unfortunately, his character matched his looks. He loved hurting others, and loved watching others being hurt. That is why watching White Fang, as he killed other dogs, gave him a lot of pleasure. And as he watched, the desire to possess this cruel dog started to grow in him. Yes, he would buy it. It didn't take him long to find out who White Fang belonged to, and soon Grey Beaver received a visit from Beauty Smith, who was offering him a large sum of money for the dog. But Grey Beaver didn't want to sell White Fang, and since he had grown quite rich with selling his furs and moccasins, he didn't need to sell his best dog. White Fang is not for sale. 
It's the best dog I've ever had. And what is more, he can fight. He can kill other dogs as easily as men kill mosquitoes. Beauty Smith's eyes lit up at this, and he licked his thin mouth with his yellow tongue. He really wanted to have this dog, and he would have him. He knew the ways of the Indians. From that day on, Beauty Smith visited Grey Beaver very often, and each time there would be a bottle of whiskey under his coat. Grey Beaver grew to like whiskey a lot. Soon he wanted more and more of it. The money he had received for his furs and moccasins he started to spend on the bottles Beauty Smith was bringing. In the end, all his money was gone. It was then that Beauty Smith talked to him again about the sale of White Fang. But this time the price he offered was in bottles of whiskey, not in dollars. And Grey Beaver's ears were more willing to hear it. When White Fang came back into the camp that evening, he saw that the White God wasn't there. He was pleased. He didn't like that God at all. From the moment he saw Beauty Smith, he felt he should avoid him at all costs. But it wasn't to be so. No sooner had White Fang laid down to rest than Grey Beaver put a thick rope around his neck. Then... He sat down next to his dog with a bottle of whiskey and waited. An hour passed, and White Fang recognised the familiar footsteps. It was Beauty Smith coming to claim his dog. White Fang saw how Grey Beaver passed the rope into Beauty Smith's hands, and he understood that while he pushed him out of the camp, he wanted him to go with the White God, and although he didn't want to, he followed Beauty Smith into Fort Yukon and let himself be tied outside of his house. There, he waited an hour, and then within ten seconds cut with his teeth through the rope and was free. Soon he was back sleeping outside of Grey Beaver's teepee. But what had happened before was repeated, but with one difference. When Beauty Smith came to take White Fang with him, he first gave him a beating. White Fang did understand why. He had seen dogs changing owners before. He knew that Grey Beaver wanted him to stay with the White God. But he had given his body and soul to Grey Beaver, and he had made Grey Beaver his particular god. He was not going to give up his god so easily. So even though this time Beauty Smith tied him not with a rope but with a stick, he still managed to free himself and was outside Grey Beaver's teepee by the morning. The beating he received this time from Beauty Smith was the worst in his life. It would have killed a weaker dog, and by the end of it White Fang was sick. He could hardly move. Beauty Smith had to wait for an hour before he could start slowly pulling White Fang behind him in the direction of Fort Yukon. This time, he tied the dog with a metal chain which was stronger than White Fang's teeth. Still, though sick and tired, all night he tried to crush the chain or pull at it. But nothing worked, and White Fang remained in Fort Yukon as the property of a madman, whom he knew he must accept as his master from now on. Chapter 6 The Mad God A few months with Beauty Smith made White Fang an enemy of all things, brutal and ferocious. His new master kept him tied at all times, in a small place surrounded by a wooden fence. There he teased him, Beauty Smith very quickly found out how much White Fang hated the sound of human laughter, so he played painful tricks on him, hurt him, and then pointed his finger at him and laughed loudly. This drove White Fang absolutely mad. The torture made him hate everything around him, the chain he was tied with, 
the wooden fence around him, the men who came to look at him, the dogs which accompanied the men. He hated everyone and everything. But most of all, he hated Beauty Smith. But Beauty Smith had a purpose in all that he did to White Fang. He wanted to make a proper fighter dog of him. And he succeeded. One day, a large group of men gathered around White Fang's fence. Beauty Smith came inside the fence and took the chain off his dog's neck. He left, but the door remained open. A second later, White Fang saw a huge dog being pushed inside. Then the door was closed again. White Fang was in an ecstasy of hatred. Here was something he could vent his anger on. And it was a living thing too. He dumped on the dog and sank his teeth into his neck. The men outside clapped their hands and applauded. There was no hope for the other dog from the start. He was too slow and not angry enough. White Fang was the obvious winner. In the end, Beauty Smith had to come in and beat White Fang with a wooden stick while the owner pulled the other dog out. Then the men paid their bets and money shone in Beauty Smith's hands. White Fang started to look forward to those gatherings of men outside his fence. It meant a fight and fighting and killing was now the only way in which he could express the life that was in him. Beauty Smith judged his strengths well, and White Fang won every single fight, and with every fight he grew more brutal and ferocious. Beauty Smith had truly managed to bring out the worst in him. Soon he became known in the land as the Fighting Wolf. It was then that Beauty Smith decided they should go on tour. They got on a steamboat and went to Dawson. There, Beauty Smith kept him in a cage and exhibited him for money as the fighting wolf. He was given no rest. In order to make the exhibition interesting for the audience, he was kept angry at all times. And in addition to this, he was also a professional fighting animal. So whenever a fight could be arranged... Beauty Smith never wasted a chance to earn more golden coins. It was a brutal land, and brutal times, and the fights were usually to the death. But White Fang always won, and as the time went by there were fewer and fewer fights. There was no dog as good as White Fang, and the game started to lose its point for the audience. But then, next spring, a man arrived in Dawson with the first bulldog that had ever come to the land. A fight between him and White Fang was soon arranged, and for a week nothing else was spoken of in certain parts of the town. When Cherokee, the bulldog, entered White Fang's fighting grounds, the audience wasn't kept waiting long for the spectacle. White Fang jumped onto the bulldog, more like a cat than a dog, and tore his ear into two. But Cherokee didn't even make a sound. This really surprised White Fang. He jumped on him again and tore his shoulder open. Blood appeared on the bulldog's soft skin, but he made no sound still. This dog was different to any White Fang had fought before. He had no hair to protect him, he was soft and could be bitten easily, but he didn't seem to mind it much. The time went on, and White Fang danced on, jumping and giving wounds, but the bulldog was still on his feet, patiently following White Fang with his eyes on White Fang's throat. White Fang knew that to kill the dog, he had to cut the vein in his throat but the bulldog was too short for it to be done while he was standing up, and there was no way of knocking him off his feet. His legs were short and strong, and he kept his neck firm and close to the ground. But White Fang tried and tried again, and he tried once too often. While trying to get to Cherokee's neck, he exposed his own, and this was exactly 
what the bulldog had been waiting for. His teeth closed on White Fang's throat, and he was not going to let it go. Whatever White Fang did from that moment, however much he threw himself and the bulldog about, Cherokee held on to his neck. The battle was not yet over, but it already looked as though White Fang was for the first time going to lose. With every movement, the bulldog's teeth closed a little tighter on White Fang's neck, and White Fang's breath was becoming shorter and shorter. Cherokee's supporters started to cheer, while Beauty Smith couldn't believe that he was about to lose all his money. But when he saw White Fang closing his eyes with resignation, he knew all hope was lost. And he felt angry, more angry than ever before. He ran up to White Fang and started to kick him as hard as he could. The crowd looked in amazement as Beauty Smith was kicking his dying dog. But not a single person moved to stop him. Suddenly, a young man started to push his way through the crowd. Nobody had noticed him before. His grey eyes shone with anger. He ran up to Beauty Smith and, without saying a word, punched him in the face. Beauty Smith fell into the snow and was in too much shock to move again. You cowards, shouted the man, and everything went silent. You beasts! Then he turned to an older man following him. Come on, Matt, lend me a hand, we've got to pull them apart. It took the two men over half an hour to open Cherokee's jaws wide enough for White Fang to pull out his neck from between them. The bulldog's owner looked terrified all the while, and as soon as he could he put a rope round Cherokee's head and disappeared as fast as he could. In the meantime, Matt examined White Fang. Very nearly, he said, but he's breathing all right now. Hey, Mr. Beast, the young man turned to Beauty Smith. I'm taking your dog with me, and I'm going to give you a hundred and fifty for him. Beauty Smith sat up. I'm not selling, he said slowly. Oh, yes, you are, the man answered calmly, because... I am buying. Here's your money. The dog's now mine. Understand? Yes. Beauty Smith snarled quietly and looked even nastier and uglier than before. Once the two men and White Fang had driven away, somebody in the crowd asked, Who was that? Weed and Scott, somebody answered. It's one of them gold experts. I say, if you want to keep out of trouble, keep away from him. He's friends with all the officials. I thought he must be somebody, was the last comment Beauty Smith heard, before he managed to pick up all his dollar notes from the snow and disappear in the direction of the town. Chapter 7 The Love Master it's hopeless, said Weedon Scott. We've had him for two weeks, and, if anything, he's now wilder than ever. He and Matt were sitting on the steps of Scott's house and looking at White Fang, who was at the end of a stretched chain, snarling, trying to get closer to the other dogs. We should give him a chance, said Matt, and turn him loose, but with a club. Scott nodded slowly, and Matt took a club and came up to the chained animal. White Fang smiled, but didn't move. He didn't take his eyes off the club for a second. See him watching the club? asked Matt. It's a good sign. He's no fool. He won't touch me as long as I'm holding it. Matt took the chain off White Fang's neck and stepped back. White Fang couldn't believe he was free. He didn't know what to think of it. He walked slowly and carefully to the corner of the room. 
Poor devil, Scott said in a sad voice. What he needs is a bit of human kindness. He walked over to White Fang and began talking to him gently. And at the sound of his voice, White Fang began to growl. But the god didn't make any movement, only talked and talked in a quiet, soft voice. He talked to White Fang as nobody had done before, and this softness and kindness of his voice somehow, somewhere touched the dog. In spite of his instinct, White Fang began to have confidence in this god. Then, the god held out a piece of meat. But White Fang was suspicious. He wouldn't take it from the god's hand. So, after a few minutes, the god threw the meat to White Fang. He smelt it, and without taking his eyes off the god, ate it quickly. Still nothing bad happened, and then the god actually offered him another piece of meat and another one, and then there came a time when the god refused to throw the meat to White Fang. He kept it in his hand, offering it to White Fang. It was good meat, and White Fang was hungry. Bit by bit, very slowly, he came up to the hand. He never took his eyes off the god and ate the meat quickly. He licked his fangs and waited. The god offered him more meat, talking to him in his soft and quiet voice. Then the god's hand began to move in his direction. The hair rose on White Fang's head and neck, and he began to growl. But the hand was still coming closer to his head. He growled and growled, but finally, in spite of himself, he let it rest on his head. The god talked and talked while his hand was stroking White Fang's head. It didn't hurt. It was even a kind of nice feeling. Well, Mr. Scott, Matt's laughing voice came from the door. You might be a number one gold expert, but you missed the chance of your life when you didn't run off as a little boy to join the circus. This was how the old life ended and a new life began for White Fang. The next months required constant thinking and endless patience on the part of Weed and Scott to make it possible. And on the part of White Fang, it required a true revolution. He started to like this new god, and in time this like changed into love. It was a slow process, but this was really what happened. He began to feel a strong need to be with the god, to have his hands stroking his head, and to hear his soft voice talking to him. He would give up anything for the company of the god, Several times he gave up meat or a warm place of rest to accompany the god on a walk or trip to town. Months passed, and the two of them grew to love each other so much that when a time came for Whedon Scott to go back to his family in the south, there was no question of White Fang not going with him. When they finally arrived at Judge Scott's, Whedon's father's farm just outside of San Francisco, White Fang could not believe his own eyes. There was a big house with a garden round it and pastures with lots of live animals walking free. Soon he would have to learn that those live things were not to be killed. There were also people, all of whom, in White Fang's opinion, wanted to get much too close to his love god. But soon he learned that they were the family of the god and as such had to be respected. And there was a female dog called Collie, who White Fang tried to avoid at all times. His instinct wouldn't allow him to attack her, but she had no such instinct, and would snarl at him whenever she saw him. It was a truly new life for White Fang, and he was learning new rules every day. But he would learn anything for the sake of pleasing his love master. Time passed, and White Fang adapted more and more to the life on the farm. He grew to respect his master's family and to ignore the farm animals. He even got used to Collie, 
who was surprisingly nice to him at times. He was happy for the first time in his adult life. It was about this time that the newspapers were writing about nothing but the escape of Jim Hall from the worst prison in the country. Jim Hall was a ferocious man and had committed a terrible crime. It was Whedon's father, Judge Scott, who had sentenced him to a life in prison three years before, and it was then that Jim Hall promised he would escape from prison and kill the judge. Now everybody at the Scott farm was afraid that Jim Hall was going to keep his promise. White Fang didn't know any of these things, but he had a secret with Alice, his master's wife. Every night, when everyone was in their beds, Alice would come downstairs and let White Fang into the house. Both of them knew it was against the rules, which said that the dogs would sleep outside. So every day, early in the morning, when everyone was still in bed, Alice would come down again and let White Fang out. On one such night, while all the house was asleep, White Fang woke up and lay very quietly. He smelt a strange god's presence in the air. Then he heard movements. The god walked softly, but White Fang could walk even softer. He followed the god unnoticed until the god stopped at the staircase leading to the family bedrooms. The hair stood up on White Fang's neck, and when the god lifted his foot to go up, White Fang attacked without warning. The whole house awoke in alarm. The noise from downstairs sounded like a terrible battle, but it lasted no longer than three minutes, and by the time Weed and Scott had switched on the light in the hall, it was all over. Not knowing yet what had happened, he and Judge Scott began to slowly go downstairs with their guns ready. But there was no need for the guns. White Fang had done his work. Weed and Scott came up to the dead man lying on the floor and turned him over to see who it was. Jim Hall, said Judge Scott, and looked meaningfully at his son. Then they turned to White Fang. He too was lying on his side. His eyes were closed and his body seemed to grow weaker and weaker on the floor. Judge Scott looked at him and picked up the phone to call in the doctor. Well, he has a one in a thousand chance of surviving, said the doctor half an hour later. He's got a broken leg and three bullet holes through him. But we mustn't lose any chance to help him said Judge Scott, we'll do everything we can to save his life. And they did. For weeks the whole family was employed to look after White Fang, who, since he couldn't move, mostly slept and dreamt a lot. Then there came a day when the last bandage and the last plaster were taken off. The whole house gathered around White Fang. He was still very weak, and could barely stand on his four legs. He'll have to learn to walk again, said the doctor. He might as well start now. It won't hurt him. And so White Fang was taken outside to walk, but he was still weak and didn't go far. He lay on the nearest lawn and rested. And then he noticed Collie, lying there too with six puppies by her side. The master helped one puppy to walk over to White Fang, who looked at the small dog in surprise. And then the puppy touched noses with him, and he felt his warm tongue on his face. White Fang's tongue went out, and he didn't know why or how, he licked the puppy's face. Then the other puppies came towards him, and he licked them all, and then allowed them to walk all over him as he patiently lay in the sun, with his eyes half-closed, happier than ever before.